Thank you so much for joining us on this lovely September evening. From everyone at the Howenstein Center, we are thrilled to be with you tonight as we begin our Common Ground Initiative programming for a new academic year with a conversation between two nationally renowned West Michigan historians. My name is Scott St. Louis, and I have the privilege of serving as the program manager for the Common Ground Initiative in the Howenstein Center right here at Grand Valley State University. To members of the Grand Valley Board of Trustees and senior management team, to the Howenstein Center family and the Meyer family, and to all of you here tonight whose dedicated support makes our work possible, we offer our deepest thanks for everything that you do to make West Michigan the wonderful place that it is to live, to work, and to think. Programs like this simply would not be possible without your commitment to Ralph Howenstein's vision for ethical, effective leadership in the 21st century. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. It also gives me great joy this evening to recognize the hard work of West Michigan's rising generation of historians. In the audience tonight are two students from Forest Hills Eastern High School, Kyle Cordy and Claire Parrish, who recently spent months researching Senator Arthur Vandenberg to produce a National History Day project that won best entry in Michigan history at the state level and the Global Peace Prize at the national level. With more than a half million, yes, Kyle, Claire, stand and be recognized. More than half a million students around the country compete in National History Day. Kyle and Claire rose to the top of the heap, and we thank them for sharing a story that matters with an emerging generation of citizens. Uh, as many of you already know, the Howenstein Center has three important roles. We are a presidential studies center, we are home to the Common Ground Initiative, and we are a center for leadership excellence. Our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy is currently providing more than 60 student fellows with access to rigorous educational and professional development opportunities. Those of you who attend our events on a regular basis know that we enjoy sharing the stage with our fellows. In fact, our Leadership Minute series has given some of these students a chance to share with us the experiences that drew them to the academy, how the academy has shaped their growth as leaders, and what they plan to do in the future with what they've learned at the Howenstein Center. Tonight's Leadership Minute will be given by Amber Garretts, who is majoring in Group Social Studies and Education. Please help me give a warm welcome to Amber. <clears throat> My name is Amber Garretts, and I am a Cook Leadership Academy Fellow. I am so honored to be returning to the Cook Leadership Academy this year. During my past year in the Academy, and my past four years at Grand Valley, serving on executive boards, working as a leadership staff assistant in the Office of Student Life, presenting at conferences, and student teaching at Brookside Elementary, several experiences have shaped who I am as a person and as a leader. As I rapidly approach graduation, I reflect on the relationships I have built through the Cook Leadership Academy. Getting to know the cohort of fellows, connecting with my mentor, Dr. Margulis, and meeting community leaders in business, education, government, philanthropy, have been incredibly rewarding experiences. Paired with these invaluable relationships have been the Academy's leadership labs, self-reflection seminars, the wheelhouse talks, which have expanded my worldview and spurred authentic conversations about emotional intelligence, fierce conversations, and vulnerability in leadership. I first joined the Academy due to my interest in professional growth, and throughout my fellowship, I have been fueled by our community's shared values of intentionality, empathy, and authenticity. I have received an incredible cross-disciplinary snapshot of leadership, and this has empowered and prepared me for a future of continued servant leadership in education. My name is Amber Garretts, and I am a leader. Thank you, Amber. Our speakers this evening are already familiar to most of you, but for those of you who are new to the Howenstein Center, allow me to offer a few brief words of introduction. In addition to his leadership in business and philanthropy in West Michigan, Hank Meyer is also an accomplished historian and biographer. Most recently, he is the author of Arthur Vandenberg, The Man in the Middle of the American Century, published by the University of Chicago Press, one of this country's premier scholarly imprints in the field of history. This book is the offspring of more than two decades of painstaking research and careful preparation. Having just been published this year, it is already making an impact in academic and policy circles. Hank is joined this evening by Richard Norton Smith, who has directed the presidential libraries and museums for Abraham Lincoln, Herbert Hoover, Dwight Eisenhower, Gerald Ford, and Ronald Reagan. He's also a former director of the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas, 
a former freelance writer for the Washington Post, and a former speechwriter for two US senators, Edward Brooke and Bob Dole. Richard is the author of numerous political biographies, including the authoritative Thomas E. Dewey and His Times, weighing in at almost 700 pages. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And most recently, Richard published on his own terms, A Life of Nelson Rockefeller, published by Random House in 2014. <laughs> is, oh my goodness. <laughs> I have nothing to follow up with other than to say that our moderator for tonight's conversation is our very own Gleaves Whitney, who has served as the first full-time director of the Howenstein Center since 2003. Please help me welcome Hank, Richard, and Gleaves. Thank you. Well, thank you, Scott. And also, thanks to all of you for coming here on a Friday night. What a break we're going to have from some of the news we've been watching. A welcome break. <laughs> Allow me to set the scene for this evening's conversation. We think we live in challenging times, and in many ways, of course, they are. But if you go back 100 years and look at what our country and the world were going through then, there was such tumult that the British historian Arnold Toynbee dubbed the era a time of troubles. And boy, was the world uh, troubled in so many ways between about 1914 and 1968. Now, Ralph Hallenstein, who was born in 1912, agreed with that assessment. And a little review will explain why, to set the scene for tonight's discussion. From 1914 to 1918, there was the First World War, in which more than 10 million people died. Then there was the hyperinflation of the 1920s, when you had a number of people's savings wiped out. Then there was the Great Depression of the 1930s that wiped out people's employment, their way of making a, a very living. From 1939 to 1945, the Second World War in which more than 60 million people were uh, killed. And by the way, it's interesting, historians should always point out that the United States was the only great power that emerged from World War II stronger at the end than when it went into the war. It was that much of a devastating world war. Then after 1945, of course, the most powerful nations vied to join the most macabre international association ever assembled, that of being a nuclear power with the capacity for the first time in human history to destroy every living being on the planet. And as if all that were not enough, and we had what historians call in a shorthand way the 1960s, the 60s revolution which had much good about it and also much challenging about it. But as the poet W.H. Auden remarked, the era was an age of anxiety. Now right in the middle of this age of anxiety, this time of troubles, there occurred, uh, 75 years ago this week in fact, an obscure, now forgotten conference up on Mackinac Island that featured some of the most compelling leaders of the day. And we're going to get colorful portraits of those leaders in just a few moments. You won't find the Mackinac Conference of 1943 in our history textbooks. Most people only learn about it, I think accidentally, when they're strolling past the Grand Hotel and they read the historical marker. Yep. Well, it was Hank Meyer who, fresh off the publication of his great biography of Arthur Vandenberg last fall, suggested that we resurrect Americans' collective memory about what happened in our very own state, something that we should be proud of. What happened on Mackinac Island 75 years ago this week? And so he suggested that the Howenstein Center host some kind of event. Soon Richard Norton Smith joined the conversation since he had written the biography of Thomas E. Dewey, as Scott just indicated. And um, when I vetted the idea about having Hank and Richard in this conversation this evening with a good friend of the Hallenstein Center, H.W. Brands, said, who else should we be making part of this conversation tonight? Well, Bill came back. He said, no, you don't need anybody else. You have the two world experts of what was going on in the Republican Party in mid-century right here in West Michigan. And aren't we fortunate for it? So we're really happy um, to, to have 
both of them here. And with that preface to this evening's program, Richard, I'd like to begin by asking you to give us some of the historical and political background to the Mackinac Conference that occurred in September 1943. Set it up for us. What did it, why did it come about? Well, first of all, thank you for the nice compliment. The truth is there aren't anyone, other, anyone else interested in the Republican <laughs> Party in the 1940s. Um, here's the reason why I wrote the first, and I think thus far probably the only biography of Tom Dewey. Um, whatever happened on Mackinac um, has to be seen, it seems to me, in the context of the, of the politics of the time. Um, you had a Republican Party. It's appropriate that uh, we're, we're meeting under the auspices of the Common Ground Initiative because Mackinac was all about trying to find common ground. Um, I said at lunch today there, there were two Republican parties. Uh, there were the party that read the Chicago Tribune and the party that read the New York Herald Tribune um, and really did the twain meet. Um, that was part of the background. In 1943, the spring of 1943, two books were published about post-war policy. And it neatly uh, embodied, I think, the two Republican parties, if you will. Wendell Wilkie, the improbable nominee in 1940, had returned from a 50-day round-the-world journey, in the course of which he had said nice things about Stalin and pissed off Churchill and Attlee together, which was pretty impressive. Um, and he wrote a book called One World. Um, and it sold a million copies. Um, it sold a million copies without endearing him to a single Republican delegate. <laughs> because by 1943, most Republicans were repenting of what they had done in 1940, tossing away uh, uh, more regular Republican candidates, people like Tom Dewey and Bob Taft, and yes, Arthur Vandenberg, to nominate this until recently Democrat, um, barefoot boy from Wall Street, as Harold Ickes referred to him, the son of Rushville, Indiana, who was more at home in the canyons of Manhattan, um, and of all things, was the head of a utilities company. Uh, the Commonwealth and Southern, the largest private utilities company in America, whose opposition to the New Deal was grounded narrowly uh, in terms of his opposition to government going into competition with the private sector for the generation of power. When it came to the field of foreign policy, Wilkie out-Roosevelted Roosevelt. But the delegates who uh, were swept off their feet in Philadelphia in 1940 didn't know that. One of them, a young Yale Law student named Jerry Ford, who was supposed to be in New Haven that very day at a press conference unveiling the manifesto of America First, the isolationist organization organized at Yale Law School by Ford and, uh, and a few of his buddies. But it's a measure of the, of the charisma of Wilkie um, and the, um, the suspension of political norms that he wasn't in New Haven, he was in Philadelphia in the galleries shouting, we want Wilkie. And he got Wilkie. And in the fall, um, Wilkie ran a very respectable race, but, you know, didn't come close. Then the question became, as we got into the war, what kind of country, what kind of world did we want to come out of the war? Wilkie wrote One World, which was a very high-minded, idealistic, Wilsonian volume. Wilkie was a Wilsonian Democrat, and he was very comfortable with much of FDR's rhetoric. Herbert Hoover wrote a book called The Problems of Lasting Peace, which was a very different much more pragmatic formula for post-war world. Wilson, remember, Hoover had been at Versailles. He had seen and he experienced the hopes and the disappointments that came out of the war. 
he had been part of Woodrow Wilson's war cabinet. He argued that we want to avoid a repeat of history. We don't want a Versailles peace conference. In fact, we don't want a peace conference at all. We want to have a cooling off period. <coughs> we want to create some interim measures, maybe regional councils, an idea that Winston Churchill had endorsed. We wanted to eliminate any idea of reparations. We wanted to immediately um, get food to the hungry. But we would worry about world organizations later. In a nutshell, I think it's fair to say, those were the two competing schools of thought. Do we, with Wilkie, before the war ends, immediately begin drawing up a world organization and, critically, a world organization with an army of its own? That was a determining factor. If, if you were um, sufficiently Wilsonian or Rooseveltian or Wilkieite, you were willing to suspend American sovereignty when it came to the idea of a global army. Hmm. Needless to say, Herbert Hoover uh, and most Republicans took exception to that idea. But they, they didn't want to repeat history either in the sense that Mackinac came about because they didn't want to repeat Henry Cabot Lodge and the defeat of the League of Nations. They didn't want to be tagged during the war or after the war as isolationists. Um, and so the party was split. The party looked ahead to 44. The polls showed, surprisingly, if people believed the war was over by the time of the election or by the time of the next inauguration, they would be inclined to vote Republican. If, on the other hand, they believed the war was still going on, then they would vote a fourth term to FDR. So the Republican national chairman, a man named Harrison Spangler, created a post-war policy group. And there were 49 Republicans on it, senators, governors, representatives of the whole spectrum of thought. And he decided that he would bring everyone together. Um, indeed, this, of course, Vandenberg comes in. Vandenberg offers to host uh, this unprecedented conference at Mackinac Island in September of 1943. And that's the backdrop. Thank you. Hank, what would you like to add to that? Well, and, and, and it's a backdrop because with the election looming in 44, as, as Richard said, you had this, this schism in the party that had been there um, before the war between the loosely labeled isolationists and internationalists. And, and they needed a platform to run on that would, would at least paper over, if not heal this schism, to have a chance to gain, gain seats in Congress, if not dislodge Roosevelt, who at that point would have been in power for 12 years, and the Republicans were chafing at having been in the minority for so long. And there was a, there was a third book I was thinking about, Richard, and that was Walter Lippmann, who was mm. the most influential pundit of the day, had written a book in 1943 called The Shield, American Foreign Policy, The Shield of the Republic. And in that, Lippmann, who also had been at Versailles, uh, was advocating a post-war alliance between the U.S. and Britain. Now, the isolationist and, and Vandenberg had taken to heart Washington's farewell address written by Hamilton, talking of, and, and Jefferson as well, Jefferson's words as well, of no entangling alliances. That had been the, the peacetime mantra of the nationalist isolationists forever. And Lippmann was saying, no, look what happens if, if Britain would have fallen or would fall and the sea lanes were no longer protected by the Royal Navy, the United States would be in jeopardy. We need an alliance of these two great democracies. And so Tom Dewey, I think, had been reading that book before he arrived. And these 49 officials, were they were the leading Republican elected officials of the day. And Harrison Spangler, the RNC chair, had invited only elected officials. So Wendell Wilkie, who had aspirations to come back again in 44, was not invited. 
And in fact, the, the one of the commentators saying that the ghost of Wilkie is hovering over this conference. There was, in fact, someone who, there was a wonderful practical joke played. Yes. At one point during the conference, someone who I believe to this day is unidentified, but anyway, they, they made arrangements to announce over the loudspeaker, paging Wendell Wilkie. <laughs> <laughs> Going through the lobby of the Grand. <laughs> At the hotel. And of course, everyone cleared out like, uh, you know. <laughs> But no, it's safe to say Wendell Wilkie would not have been invited. In fact, this, this conference was structured from the, from the get-go, not only to uh, uh, not showcase Wilkie or give him a platform, but to finalize the party's divorce. <laughs> to marginalize Wilkie as the Republican establishment was reasserting itself. Yeah. And, and so Vandenberg was charged with chairing the Foreign Policy Committee, this post-war advisory group, and finding a platform that all the Republicans could agree to run on. And this was a time when, as, as Richard said, uh, everybody from congressmen to columnists to ordinary citizens are beginning to wonder what the world is going to look like after the war and what is America's role in it. And the ideas were bubbling up in Congress. There were resolutions being introduced all the time by young William Fulbright as a, as a congressman and soon-to-be senator, by other senators and congressmen with ideas for a post-war international organization, some reflecting the Wilkie point of view, some reflecting others. But Roosevelt was properly, I think, concerned that if the Congress starts debating what the world looks like after the war, we have two key allies. The Russians, who have their own post-war plans, for, particularly for Eastern Europe, and the British, who have an empire that Churchill is interested in retaining and reclaiming. And so anything that starts to talk about what a world organization is going to look like and, and self-determination of peoples and some of the old Wilsonian ideas are going to bump into potentially both Soviet concerns and the British concerns, and we've got to hold this alliance together to win the war. And so he's, he's quashing, in, in a democratic Congress, he's quashing these resolutions that are bubbling up. So those, that's not being expressed. And so now in Mackinac, the Republicans, who weren't expected to make any news, and all the, the reporters who were coming out from New York and elsewhere are kind of saying, you know, we've gone an awful long ways to to hear the Republicans give us some platitudes, are surprised when first Dewey arrives and said, you know, maybe there might, maybe it would make sense to have a post-war treaty like Lippmann described. Yeah, it, it's interesting because uh, Tom Dewey had many virtues, but spontaneity was not, was not one of them. Um, he had a sort of Nixonian quality um, in that uh, he never did anything without um, calculating the consequences. So when he, uh, off the top of his head, uh, arrived. Now he had been he'd been meeting with Vandenberg. He met with Vandenberg three times, in secret, um, before coming out to to Michigan. They'd met in New York. Um, the governor had a suite at the Hotel Roosevelt. Um, he had no money, uh, and so the State Party of New York rented this four room dingy suite, which was his New York City home. And that's where he entertained people like uh, Vandenberg. Uh, but anyway, uh, so they'd obviously had lengthy discussions about exactly how they wanted this to turn out. So, you know, it's curious. Basically, Dewey was interested in what we would call today dominating the news cycle. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say he was the presumed favorite for the nomination in 44. He was ambivalent about it. Uh, he saw those same polls. He didn't really want to run in 44. His lifelong adversary, Bob Taft, had formally taken himself out of the 44 race because he intended to run in 48, which gives you an idea of what most Republicans thought. So all of this was, was a gamble. But he arrives in uh, Mackinac and in, return, in exchange, a reporter asks him, and he casually mentions, without, I believe, mentioning Whitman, but he mentions that, you know, he thinks it would be good to have this post-war alliance, a formal alliance, between the United States and Great Britain. And, and then he modified that when, obviously, he was asked, and he said that would be the core 
and then hopefully the two other great powers, Russia and China, could uh, join the club. And so that was, you know, that was Dewey's position. He said nothing about, and indeed in saying nothing about, he said a lot about uh, the idea of a, of a world army. I mean, that was, um, the, the, the irony is, to show you how tactical this position was, once he was actually nominated, he took a totally different viewpoint. He, he criticized the administration, the early organizers of the United Nations, for leaving out what we would call the third world, all the, the little countries. Um, and I've, I've spent a lot of time getting to know Tom Dewey and writing about Tom Dewey, and I can't tell you for sure which he believed. I, th I suspect he believed both whenever he said it. Um, <laughs> but, he, but he knew, you know, the important thing about Mackinac, and, and it, it's true, we don't, there's no one here, I suspect, who could get up and quote the Declaration of Mackinac. It's not the one Mackinac of those. Mackinac Charter, yeah. Like, yeah, it's not one of those timeless documents that we, we read on the 4th of July and, uh, and hand on to our grandchildren. But it, that doesn't matter, because what Mackinac represents symbolically is really the first concrete evidence of bipartisan foreign policy. And coming from a party that had, fair or not, a reputation for being not only isolationist in its thinking, but thoroughly negative in, in terms of, mm -hmm. of, of that kind of cooperation uh, as, on, a, on a global, a global it scale. It was really the first collective expression of support for what would become the United Nations. For saying, as long as we don't give up our sovereignty, so you know, no, no mention of any armies or anything, right. we believe that the United States should enter into, should participate in organized collaboration after the war. And that was a, that was a statement that, that could be hammered out because Taft was apoplectic when Dewey wanted to do the treaty with Britain. And he so, thought it a fool thing to do. Yes, and Vandenberg had to pull them, pull them together to come to some agreement, and they, it was a pretty anodyne statement, like you say, not a memorable, <laughs> but it was something. This is, the, this is the, the quote. They adopted a resolution favoring, quote, responsible United States participation in post-war cooperative organization among sovereign nations, that's there for the Tafts, to prevent military aggression and to attain permanent peace with organized justice, that's there for Dewey, in a free world. Now, I, do you know what that means? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, but it's a testament to Vandenberg's diplomatic skills and political judgment that he, more than anyone else, at least as far as I could tell, uh, took this disparate group and got them to agree on something. Well, and he loved the word justice too, which may, may have been a code for making sure that the, that the polls would have free elections, because that was very important to his Michigan constituency as well. Well, and that's why Tom Dewey discovered small nations. Right. Small nations had large voting blocks in the American electorate, and the polls were probably... Loved in fact, after the war, in, in the post-war uh, treaty before 48, um, Dewey was the Dewey was quicker to accord um, uh, aid to the Italians than, than Vandenberg was comfortable with, because of course they had fought with the Germans. But as John Foster Dulles explained to Vandenberg, uh, we need the Italian vote, so we've got to. Well, and in fact, and that was really the beginning of Italian, you know, Italians became, particularly in New York, a very reliable Republican constituency, which had not been the case before. And that's a name, by the way, that we should not leave out of the conversation. John Foster Dulles, who um, was really better known as a lawyer and a churchman um, than as a diplomat, but who, who became, John Foster Dulles was to Dewey what Kissinger was to Nixon. And John, when, when, when Vandenberg was in the American delegation going to the UN, he brought John Foster Dulles as his advisor. So he got Dulles through Dewey. <coughs> Hank, we had the opportunity with Mike Grass, who's back there, I think, somewhere in the back row, uh, 
to go down to Austin and to meet with a very interesting person, a young woman who at the time of Mackinac Conference played a role in the journalistic side of this. You paint a wonderful picture. Uh, tell this audience what Liz experienced as she's watching what's happening. Well, some of you may remember the name Liz Carpenter. She was Lady Bird Johnson's secretary and White House communication director for a while in the Johnson administration. And she, her first assignment as, I think, a 22-year-old young reporter right out of school was working for a woman who I learned today, uh, Richard had interviewed, but uh, Esther Van Wagener Tufty ran a syndicated news <laughs> service in, in Washington, and she was the sister of Michigan Governor uh, Murray Van Wagner. And so she, she was covering the Mackinac Conference, and she had hired Liz and brought her along with them, and the two of them are up at Mackinac, and they are, because of her relationship, enjoying the governor's suite at Mackinac, which for those of you who know the porch at the Grand Hotel, at that time, the governor's suite was toward the western end of the porch, which is the quiet end of the porch, away from the crowds and, and the, the main lobby area. And, the, and there, are, there are still today very low windows, they're almost French doors, uh, along that porch. And so Liz recalled crouching down, li they're lying on the ground so that they're not visible with the window open at the far end of the porch, which was where Vandenberg liked to take the other 48 prima donnas and, as he's trying to persuade them to, to come to a common uh, consensus of this, this statement. And Liz had the wonderful image where she said, I can still see those footsteps. That's the place where isolationism ended. Now, it may have been a little short-sighted in the, in the scope of history, but it's a testament to how the party had moved, as Richard said, was moving away, Taft reluctantly being dragged in that direction, to acknowledge that the United States could no longer isolate itself in the world. And some could make the argument as much as any place that that happened at the far end of the porch of the Grand Hotel. It's, it's a great story, and <clears throat> Richard. Well, I'm gonna say, uh, just to show you how different things were, Esther Van Wagener Tufty was a character, and, and, and I managed to, to get to her while she was still around, and she told me a story. Tom Dewey, you know, had this sort of public image of being, well, he was, he was a prosecutor, the gangbuster. I mean, the people admired him for his uh, ferocious skill in putting Lucky Luciano behind bars. But, but they didn't think of him as a warm-hearted, you know, FDR had rewritten the rules and he wasn't playing by that game in any event. But <laughs> Dewey was, this was 1944, and the they were, of course, campaigning by train. And there was an accident. The train was derailed out some godforsaken place in uh, Montana, uh, near some place called Castle Rock. And she told the story. <laughs> They created something called the Castle Rock Survivors Association, <laughs> which every year met for the sole purpose of reading the treasurer's report and then reminiscing about this accident. And Esther told the story about Governor Dewey, the world's most famous lawyer, circulating among the injured reporters outside the train, giving them names of lawyers and telling them to sue. <laughs> and, and, and Esther, he... He particularly singled her out and suggested that she claimed to be pregnant at the time, <laughs> at the time of the accident. And anyway, that was a side of Tom Dewey that unfortunately the, the general public never saw. And he said not long before he died, at the very point, he said, everything came too early for me. He was 37. And the district attorney of Manhattan, when, the first time he ran for president, against FDR. He was an elder statesman at 46, mm -hmm. having lost the 48 election. And, and then, add to the poignancy, he was, he was more than anyone else responsible for both Eisenhower and Nixon being on the ticket in 52. And, and, and later on, Nixon offered him the chief justiceship. And by that time, he said, I'm too old. Well, I would like for each of you, as biographers, to share with the audience your portraits of your guy. So you have a very interesting take on something that is sort of a symbol for what
Tom Dewey became. I'm thinking of the wedding cake, so I'd like for you to talk oh, about Oh, well, that. I tell the story. And then I want Hank to talk about some of the images of Vandenberg that have come down to us. You have to remember, Tom Dewey was the first celebrity candidate for president. He uh, came from Owasso, Michigan, went to the university in Ann Arbor, um, but went to New York in the 1920s to be an opera singer. And then one night, he, he, he had a cold, and he was supposed to give a recital. And he concluded, being Tom Dewey, that he would never again allow himself to be at the mercy of forces beyond his control. And his great flaw was that he looked upon politics as a science, not an art. Uh, he was the first Republican to use pollsters, uh, uh, for which he, he paid a price. George Gallup was a very good friend of his. Um, contrary, by the way, to what you all think, he knew in 1948 that he was slipping. He knew 10 days before the election that there was a chance of losing. Um, but he was about, if generously, 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, it was said in Albany that um, he began every speech by announcing that he was not standing on a dictionary. Um, and he had a mustache, which some people thought was Charlie Chaplin-esque, and some people thought was Hitler-esque. Uh, but in any event, it was unconventional. And he had a gap between his two front teeth, which today, you know, would have been taken care of long before he announced for anything. But he, he left them both the way they are because his wife, Frances, liked him the way he was. He was an unhandlerable candidate. Um, but the line that, that unfortunately attaches to him to this day, in part because it's, it's brilliantly apropos, was that he looked like the little man on the wedding cake. <laughs> All right? And, and early in my research, I, as I said, I talked to about 175 people in, in researching my biography. And one of them was the famed authoress of that line. Alice Roosevelt Longworth. And Mrs. Longworth was almost 90, living in cheerful malice um, <laughs> near DuPont Circle in Washington in a great big old brick house that looked like something out of a Charles Adams. And uh, I wrote to her, and to my amazement, she wrote back and gave me her phone number and said, call me at such and such a time. And I did. And I asked her about her authorship of this immortal line, and she, she laughed, said, it didn't originate with me, I overheard it in my dentist's office. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how history gets written. You know, that gets repeated in story after story, book after book, and uh, it's still, I, you know, and you, well, you know, you, do, you bend over backwards to get things right, and you dig, and you surprise yourself with what you find, and you lay it all out there, and five years go by, <laughs> you see the same old inaccuracies. But um, one quick, what Tom Dewey, in the last weeks of his life, actually, it's almost apropos of what we're living through right now. This is in the first year of the Nixon administration, and members of the cabinet were not happy. George Bush was then, George H.W. Bush was head of the RNC. Mel Laird was the ever scheming Secretary of Defense and a very good friend of Ford's. Anyway, five members of the cabinet that I was told, plus Bush, would meet on a regular basis to kvetch over what was wrong with the Nixon White House. And inevitably, the conversation always came back to Haldeman and Orkman. And a consensus formed, George Romney was part of this cabal, uh, John Volpe. Anyway, that someone had to go to the president and talk turkey. And it had to be someone that Nixon would listen to, someone that he would take seriously, and they had to convince him that he had to get rid of Haldeman and Orkman or they would sink the administration. And um, 
Needless to say, no one in the group volunteered. <laughs> they decided the only person that Nixon would listen to was Tom Dewey. And the only one who was tough enough to go and talk to the president face to face. And at the time, Dewey was in Florida playing golf. And they agreed, that they basically were going to see him when he came back. He was due that night at the White House for Trisha Nixon's engagement party, which is how close he was to the Nixon family. And he died that day uh, uh, after playing golf. And it's classic Dewey. It's so perfect. He even died like a neat, neat Nick. Dwayne Andreas, uh, the uh, agribusiness billionaire, was, uh, was a good friend of Dewey's. And um, when Dewey didn't show up exactly on time to be taken to the airport to go to Washington, he knew something was wrong. And so he went up, and they, they went into the governor's suite, and there was Tom Dewey, fully dressed, his trademark Homburg on the bed next to him, bags all packed, <laughs> three-piece suit, you know, peacefully dead. Uh, <laughs> which is exactly the way he would have uh, wanted to go. <laughs> well, uh, well, the, the, uh, Arthur Vemmer doesn't have that image, of course, but he, was, he wanted to be a senator from the time he was in high school. His yearbook at Central High School talks about that. And his first byline as a young reporter at the Grand Rapids Herald when he was still 16 years old was on the Electoral College. And so he was, and he claimed he'd been reading the congressional record since he was 14, although there's no evidence to confirm that. But he, he was influencing the national debate, writing about the League of Nations, trying to impress Republican leaders. So he's corresponding with Henry Cabot Lodge. Lodge is using his lines um, the, mm -hmm. during the League of Nations debate when he's a young editor back in Grand Rapids. Uh, we were talking with Susan Lovell about uh, George Getz, who was a Republican national treasurer who had a cottage at Holland, actually an estate at Holland, Michigan. It was a coal magnet from Chicago. And uh, Vandenberg had a cottage out there for many years, and Getz would bring in Republican leaders from around the country. So he was, he was writing, he wrote Harding's campaign speech about the League of Nations, because the League of Nations was still an issue in 1920 at, after the end of the war. And the and so he he's he's coming in with this foreign policy background. He also prides himself on coining slogans. He uh, Harding's slogan, his campaign slogan, was a return to normalcy in 1920 after all the tumult of the war. And uh, Somebody asked, you know, reporters asked him where he came up with that word because grammarians have always bristled at normal, normalcy ever since then. And, and Vandenberg says, sounds like something I said. He probably, probably coined that. And yet the expression that's always been um, held against him was during when Truman announced the Truman Doctrine in 1947, where we would supplant the British in coming to the aid of in this, in this case, it was a guerrilla war with the communists in, in Greece and, and Soviet threats to Turkey. But Truman made a rather blanket statement of, we will come to the aid of, of democratic peoples anywhere. And uh, he, come, he calls in legislative leaders to present this. And Vandenberg says to Truman at the White House, uh, Mr. President, I'll support you, but you've, the, the phrase is you've got to scare the hell out of the country. In other words, you can't just drop this in Congress's lap and we'll support you. You have to energize the American people to agree to such a broad commitment of, of potential intervention. And there is no evidence that Vandenberg ever said that, sort of like Alice and Roosevelt Longworth, um, but it describes a frame of mind. What he would have rather been remembered for was the speech he gave in October of 1945 on the floor of the Senate calling for, calling out the Soviets for having dropped an iron curtain across Eastern Europe. And this is at a time when Churchill had used the phrase in a speech in Parliament, 
and it used the phrase, I think, in correspondence with Truman, but nobody in the U.S. had actually used that phrase, and Vandenberg was so proud of it, he printed up a letterhead, and this was not uncommon if you, if you gave a big speech in the Senate, to send it out on stationery that said Iron Curtain speech. And John Foster Dulles, who by that time, after the United Nations had become a close friend and confidant of Vandenberg's as well, uh, writes back to him and says, you know, great speech, too bad nobody heard it. Because it had coincided with Eisenhower's triumphant return to the United States after the war as the great commanding general. And it wasn't until about six months later in Fulton, Missouri, where Churchill delivers his Iron Curtain speech that the expression actually catches on. So Vandenberg would much rather have had that, but he was, he was described by, I think Dean Acheson, the later Secretary of State, may have said it, and others did as well, that, but he was the, the one senator who could strut sitting down. And he was, and somebody else called him a powder pigeon. Powder pigeon. I mean, Same thing this, was said about Tom Dewey. Uh, I mean, so it, it goes Very it goes arrogant character. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, I, I interviewed uh, Clark Clifford actually the week before he was indicted. If you remember, he was had been the longtime both Truman advisor and then later defense secretary and, uh, during the Vietnam era and, and one of the, the grandees of the Democratic Party. And he said that Truman's part of Truman's genius was his willingness to let these giant egos like Dean Acheson and Vandenberg figure out what kind, what foreign policy should be, and Truman was willing to hang back and let that happen. And um, but anyway, that 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 image of Vandenberg seemed to be one that stuck. Well, and one phrase that Vandenberg deserves credit for, if you if you read the Declaration of Mackinac, um, is free world. I. Uh, he may very well have coined the expression. Now the, that I never ran across. That's kind of free, big stuff. Th that is big stuff, see? Because <laughs> he loved justice. He kept inserting justice in the UN Charter. That was his... No, the phrase, the was, free world, is incorporated. It may, In fact, it may be the one memorable thing in all that verbal sludge. That, politics uh, <laughs> stops at the water's edge. You know, that's... That, that was, concept that was as well. The yeah. Straits of Mackinac in this case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. actually, yeah. And, yeah. and Vandenberg is credited with saying politics stops at the water's edge, and he did, but Harold Stassen, I think, coined that one. Well, I would now want to invite the audience uh, to come forward with your questions to put to our two great experts on this. And in the meantime, while you're lining up, uh, let me ask you this. You know, biography is such an interesting genre. And the biographer doing the research usually discovers wonderful things. We've already been treated to a number of surprises. In your Dewey book, in your Vandenberg book, during your research, what surprised you the most of all the things that you learned that was of significance? I had confirmed my hunch that Tom Dewey was a vastly more complex interesting, uh, appealing human being than the little man on the wedding cake. Um, and that there's an element of almost tragedy about this, this man who was a prodigy um, and who came to the realization late in life that, uh, um, well, as he said, everything came too early. And I think by that he meant um, it took him a while, as it takes all of us a while, to, to grow up um, and, and to have, yeah, I guess you could say he mellowed. Uh, the single most surprising story that nobody would, would imagine, he's responsible, Hubert Humphrey always said that Tom Dewey was responsible for his being on the ticket with LBJ. And I know that sounds bizarre. Mm -hmm. In 1964, not content with a 30-point lead over Goldwater in the polls, Johnson, of course, was always, you know, he, Johnson used to say, I, you know, I don't think about politics more than about 22 hours a day. Um, uh -huh. And he came up with this great idea. He had everyone else, you know, in his corner. So now he's going to take the crime issue away from the Republicans as well. So he's going to have a national crime commission. Who better to be, you know, the bipartisan chairman of the National Crime Commission than Thomas E. Dewey, the gangbuster. Um, so he brought him to the White House, 
and he turned on the Johnson treatment, and this went on for hours. And flight after flight back to New York was missed, and eventually the last flight of the day. So Dewey had to spend the night at the White House. So Lady Bird found a pair of her husband's pajamas. <laughs> Tom Dewey, who was a foot shorter than, yeah. than LBJ. Anyway, <laughs> the next morning, he started it all over until they got to the issue. What ended the, the, the deal was uh, capital punishment. Uh, and Dewey made it very clear that he was a supporter. And that was a bridge too far for Johnson. But anyway, before he left, Dewey had become friends with Hubert Humphrey. And um, what Dewey was, Dewey was a boss. Dewey was a political boss. But a good government boss, that's a very unusual combination. He invented the $100 plate dinner in New York. And he seat, took care of the seating. If you pissed him off for any reason, he seated you behind a pillar. I mean, that, that <laughs> kind of attention <laughs> to detail, OK? Anyway, I'll so remember he, that tip. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting there with LBJ. He said, Mr. President, have you looked at the schedule for the, the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City? He said, day one is Kennedy Day. And there'll be a movie, and Jackie will be there, and Teddy, and Bobby, and Ethel, and everyone will cry. And before you know it, Bobby Kennedy will force his way onto your ticket. The one thing that Johnson didn't want to contemplate was Robert Kennedy as a running mate. Yeah. LBJ picks up the phone, calls Marvin Watson, his vir virtual chief of staff. He says, get out the schedule of the convention and move Kennedy Day from day one to day four, by which time a vice president would have been nominated. And Humphrey always said, and Humphrey was one of the last people, improbable, he, he showed up at Tom Dewey's funeral um, at St. James Church in New York. Nixon sat in the front row, and Hubert Humphrey and Barry Goldwater sat in the back row, um, which gives you an idea of, of, of how Catholic with a small c his, his interests were. He had influence where people didn't expect. But he, did, he said, I don't want to see my name in, in print for the last 20 years of his life. Well, Arthur Vandenberg wanted to see his name in print. He, in fact, he clipped out every newspaper article and posted it in his scrapbooks, which are all in the Bentley Library. That was his <laughs> Sunday afternoon pastime. But uh, he's often credited as the sort of the poster child for bipartisanship, which you know has a particular resonance today. And but he never liked that term. He liked unpartisan, which is kind of ungainly. But his it's it was fun to see through his career how that evolved because. His first and only elective office before going to the Senate, he was appointed in 1928, was on the Charter Commission for the City of Grand Rapids in 1910 to write a new city charter. And that charter created the council manager form of government, and Grand Rapids was one of the first cities in the country to do that, which was a reaction to the, to the boss-style politics that characterized so many cities. Now, he still had to put up with Frank McKay, but that's a different story. But he, and then when he got to the, and then, in 1912, when the Republican Party split in half because Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> bolted and with the Bull Moose Party, Vandenberg had one foot in both camps, and he was trying to reconcile the two, the Michigan contingents. In fact, there were there were these there was a convent, the Republican State Convention was in Bay City in the Armory, and you had Roosevelt folks on one side, and in this case William Howard Taft folks on the other side both claiming to be the legitimate representatives of the, American, of the Michigan Republican Party. And Vandenberg is doing his darndest to bring them together, and he can't. Then he goes to the Senate, and soon after, he goes to the Senate in 28, and of course, by 32, uh, the Republicans lose their majority in Congress, which they have enjoyed for the most part for generations. And and they, they become such a small minority that if you want to get anything done, which essentially means stopping elements of the New Deal, you've got to find Democrats you can work with. And so he's, he's honing that bipartisanship in that context. And first within the party and then, well, and even under Hoover, there's the split between the Eastern Old Guards and the, the Western progressives, the La Follette crowd. And Vandenberg, as this bumptious young freshman, is trying to, to get them to talk to each other. So he's always trying to reconcile conflicting forces 
first within his party and then across party lines. And so that predisposition, he's, even as he's a rock rib Republican all the way through, in 1937 he's actually in, the, in the, the depths of the Republican weakness, he's actually corresponding with a North Carolina senator, named, Democrat named Josiah Bailey, thinking, and, and this is when Roosevelt is saying, should we have a new liberal coalition? The Repub some Republicans are talking with Southern Democrats, should we have a new conservative coalition? Of course, ultimately, the Southern Democrats don't want to acknowledge that they're even talking to Republicans, and so that, that falls apart. But it's always this predisposition to reconciling conflicting forces that, that primes him then at Mackinac to be the mediator and the, and the bringing the parties together, and further uh, primes him when Republicans, when, when to make a treaty after the war, Truman needs Republicans, and the Republicans finally have somebody to work with other than Roosevelt who didn't give him the time of day, and bipartisanship can really flourish. Can I ask him a question? Absolutely. <laughs> if, if, um, if Annenberg were to walk into this room, um, what would you like to ask him? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I mean, this is going to seem sort of inside stuff. I'd, I'd like to ask him what he, what, if he ever talked with George Kennan, who was the, George Kennan was the, the, the American, he, he, he chaired the State Department's policy planning staff and advised General Marshall, and before that he'd been at the Soviet Embassy, and his, his long telegram on the sources of Soviet conduct outlined the containment, what became the containment theory that defined American foreign policy through much of the Cold War, and, uh, and paralleled Vandenberg's emerging foreign policy view after the war. And I'd really have been curious to know if they ever talked, because I don't have a record of that. And can you explain his thing about Alexander Hamilton? He was obsessed with Hamilton. Now, Hamilton was the, the penniless um, uh, clerk, I mean, I would say immigrant, washing up on American shores as, as a bright young kid who'd had a patron who'd pay his way to Columbia. Uh, Vandenberg saw Hamilton as the the unsung hero among the founding fathers. Wrote three books about Hamilton, um, none of which unfortunately became the basis of a successful theatrical production. But <laughs> but he Van, he was Vandenberg's Vandenberg's father figure in many ways. Vandenberg was a hero worshipper, which got him into trouble when he wanted to have MacArthur run for president in 1944. It was kind of embarrassing, but he just worshipped Hamilton and saw Hamilton's notion of being at once a, a strong federal government, but also one that was smart enough not to take sides in European power politics as we're in our post-revolutionary period. And, uh, and, and, the, and the picture of the northern, um, you know, Hamilton was an abolitionist and Hamilton, and, Vandenberg's grandfather had been a Lincoln delegate at the 1860 convention and was an abolitionist, may or may not have had a stop on the Underground Railway in upstate New York. Uh, so he, he, he just loved Hamilton. As a matter of fact, we were playing the musical Hamilton when you all walked in. Maybe you caught some of the tunes. <laughs> I saw some of you tapping your feet. Okay, we have a question from the audience, please. Sorry for standing there so long. You said as you're walking up, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll listen to the rules. Um, uh, Mr. Meyer, when you talk about the desire for Vandenberg to be in ter terms of bipartisanship, and you've used the word justice, and then talking about his love for Hamilton, and indeed that he was an abolitionist before abolitionists were abolitionists here, and yet so many people who perceive a desire for freedom perceive that FDR was trying to seek opportunity for everybody. And yet, he opposed the New Deal. So can you explain some, and the reason I'm asking in terms of the framework is, our, our country has become so polarized right now that you're either or, and you know, but can never be both and. So I'm wondering if you can explain from, from your understanding of his lens, 
what it is to be for justice, to want economic opportunity for everybody, and just parenthetically also in terms of his involvement with the Glass-Steagall Act and the FDIC, wondering what it is for him to want justice, and yet from the outside looking in, he seems like a typical Republican from Grand Rapids mm -hmm. who doesn't want to make sure everybody is cared for. So can you framework some of that? Uh, he was, he was, I'm gonna go was right he was, yeah, he was essentially a conservative Republican. And so that meant that he was leery of increasing executive power and federal power. And so the, and, it, and when you say he, pushed, he opposed the New Deal, he, he was generally supporting elements of the first New Deal. And, and in fact, as, as you mentioned, the FDIC, which is, is a fascinating story, when uh, one of the first big banking crises in the Depression was, was the Detroit banking crisis. Detroit, there were a couple of two big bank holding companies, and they were on the verge of collapse. Henry Ford had significant ownership in one and didn't want to put any more money in. And Vandenberg and James Cousins, the other senator from Michigan, who had once been Ford's partner and was maybe the second wealthiest person to Ford in Michigan uh, and was a, was a more liberal Republican senator, uh, their meeting with Hoover and Hoover's Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, uh, trying to, trying to, because the representatives of the Detroit banks have come to the Treasury Department and said, we're going to collapse, there's going to be a run on the bank, it's going to be devastating, can you help us? And Vandenberg is negotiating with the, uh, Hoover at the time had the Reconstruction Finance Commission and Richard, you are more expert on Hoover by far than I am. They had a certain hurdle of a certain, a certain amount of capital that the bank had to come up with before they would be rescued by the RFC. And there's negotiations on how you define the assets when the market's values are declining. And, and Vandenberg is trying to get the RFC to step in and the RFC is insisting we need a little bit more capital and Cousins and Ford are capable of putting in more capital and they're kind of, I'm not gonna do it unless you do it because they're bitter enemies and the, but finally, and, and Hoover is saying, if I could save the banks in my hometown for a couple of million dollars and I had all the money you have, Cousins, I would do it. Finally, Cousins, uh, Cousins and Ford both come through uh, Ford, though, only after he's snubbed the Treasury Department and said, let them fail, let them all fail. Um, but the, so Vandenberg comes away from there convinced that there needs to be some kind of deposit insurance. And that's been, that's a progressive notion that Hoover had resisted, Andrew Mellon, his Secretary of the Treasury, resisted, the logic being, if you have, if all banks have deposit insurance that all the banks have to pay into, the essentially the strong banks are going to be shoring up the weak banks. And that didn't seem like a very good free enterprise kind of idea. And so Hoover's resisting that. And then Roosevelt comes in and Vandenberg takes it to him. And Roosevelt is also resisting it. Now, Roosevelt maybe has more familiarity with the New York banks who didn't really want to have to finish, potentially find themselves subsidizing banks in Detroit or anywhere else, so they resist it. But Vandenberg lines up the votes. In fact, Jesse Jones, who's taken over for the, the Democrats of the Reconstruction Finance Commission, supports it. So does uh, Roosevelt's vice president, John Garner. So there's support in Congress for it, and finally, they, they he. He tags that on Glass-Steagall and the FDIC is created, which later Roosevelt takes credit for. So he had those progressive elements, but later on with, with the, um, the NRA, the National Recovery Act, and the, what, what a lot of Republicans and conservatives viewed as more intrusive government regulation, he bristled and balked at that. And so, uh, and then the, the term justice, where I use that, um, he wouldn't have been thinking in what we today think of as economic justice terms. He was th would think of that more in, in, in terms of individual liberty and 
self-determination than, than in, in maybe that more modern usage. And so uh, he, was, he was obsessed with getting, and, and he saw that as a, as a code for resisting, um, particularly at the UN, where, where he's facing off with the Soviets, as a code word for saying, we're gonna keep hope alive in Eastern Europe. And if we keep that word in there, we can keep reminding the Soviets that you signed on to a charter that called for, for justice for all. That, that was the context in, in which he was thinking of it. We have a question over here. Yes, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, that when they were first talking about a post-war peace, they were talking about making some connections between Britain and the United States. And then they expanded that to include Russia and China. But I'm wondering where Japan fit in that mix. I'm just thinking, you know, in the early 1900s, Japan worked very hard to build their military up following the British model. They were certainly a great military power in 43. So when did Japan come into the mix versus China as the premier Asian power, or did they not come into the mix at all? Uh, <laughs> no one was going to run for office in, in 1944 on a platform of, let's form an alliance with Japan. Um, and I mean, I'm not being facetious. I mean, you can, I think most of us, with the perspective of time, might scratch our heads at the thought that China, under Chiang Kai-shek, massive, corrupt, uh, ineffectual government, um, and, uh, and, and not a country with any recent record of uh, sort of a country that hadn't pulled its weight. On, on the world scene. Um, the story of Japan, of course, is after the war, when, of all people, Douglas MacArthur uh, is, the, is the new shogun who, in effect, reinvents Japan as a, as a modern democracy and an economic power. And by the, by the 1950s, treaties had been signed. Uh, John Foster Dulles actually negotiated a treaty um, and by the 1950s, as the, the, the free world versus the Soviet world uh, took shape, there was no doubt that the West uh, was then very interested in uh, having Japan as part of a, uh, an unofficial alliance. But didn't FDR look at adding the Chinese and the Russians? I mean, they were the four policemen. With, with with Britain in the U.S. That was it was FDR's conception, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. He had a, you know, and I am a great admirer of FDR, but he but he had some rather romantic notions about uh, Uncle Joe Stalin, and and above and the notion of personal diplomacy. It has nothing to do with left or right, but the notion, the ego at work that, that insists that I can charm anyone. And most of the time he could. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly um, no one in his generation came close. And he was a Protean figure when it came to charm. But people, some people like Joe Stalin um, are immune to, to charm. Well, the, I, I've often have thought recently in, in light of the most recent summit between an American president and, and a Russian leader that in, in an entirely different context, in an entirely different way, but it really was the first summit since the Yalta Conference in 1945 where a lot of Americans would wonder what's going on there and do we trust what's happening there? because Roosevelt famously didn't give the time of day to his State Department. He was, he was, he was operating on personal charm, but in a very weakened condition. Yeah. And the, the, for people like Vandenberg, they said, you know, Stalin and Churchill have very clear agendas that are communicated very well, dictated in some ways, to their staffs. We don't know what kind of deals are being cut at Yalta between Roosevelt and Stalin. And from, from Truman to Obama, across the political spectrum, I don't think there was ever that kind of uncertainty attached to a Russian-American summit until the most recent one. Mm. We've got, I think, time for two more questions. We've got a question here, and then we have a question there. Kendall? Kendall? 
Real quickly, we've heard about Dewey and we've heard about Vandenberg. What was the relationship between the two of them? <laughs> well, let's say they both would like to be president. You don't need to know a whole lot more than that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I find Vandenberg an enigmatic. I mean, uh, much less so after reading Hank's book, um, which is head and shoulders above anything else that we have. Um, but what I mean, I find enigmatic his attitude toward the presidency. Uh, famously, in 1976, Walter Mondale, who had been seen as a legitimate presidential contender, uh, basically said, I, I really don't have the stomach. I, I, he said, you know, and, and he, was, he was pressed by disbelieving reporters, and he said something to the effect that, you know, I don't want to spend the next 18 months in holiday inns. Which, if you stop to think about it, is a pretty rational uh, explanation for not running for president. And I think the equivalent, I, I don't think Arthur Vandenberg, he said once something like it, because in 36, when, when he was a serious contender, well, and when, then I when, guess for the vice president. Well, Landon so, wanted him to be vice president. He really right. worked hard to, and, to corner him, and he, he, he resisted. He wouldn't answer his phone at the, in Philadelphia. He said something, in fact, and, and uh, you can obviously quote more precisely, but at some point along the way, Vandenberg was quoted as saying something to the effect that, you know, why knock yourself out to carry Maine and Vermont? <laughs> which, which is a very refreshing well, and so the, I mean, his, his, point, and, and somewhat at odds with the caricature of Vandenberg as a rather vainglorious figure. Well, the, 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 the vanity came in and wishing to be drafted. He would have loved to have been president, but he wasn't going to work to do it. And so, yeah. you know, he was, they tried to draft him for vice president in 36. 40, he figured in, in the late 1930s, that would be his, 40 would be his year. Um, in, in the Republican leadership was so decimated. I mean, that, that Dewey could rise so quickly. There were, there were so few Republicans of stature in yeah. the country. And so, but Vandenberg says, you know, okay, I'll allow my name to go on the ballot in Wisconsin and Nebraska because other Midwestern states where, you know, they might, where I might have a chance. But he didn't, he didn't campaign. He didn't even give a speech and he didn't go to Wisconsin. Dewey, I'm reading your book, you know, gave so many speeches every day, I think went to every county in Wisconsin, out-organized Vandenberg and was there all the time. He had the fire in the belly and Vandenberg didn't. He had great respect for Vandenberg. I mean, I think Vandenberg, uh, you know, all you, in some ways, all you need to know initially about Arthur Vandenberg is in the Senate, off the Senate chamber, there's a cloakroom, I guess, the Senate room, where um, originally back in the 1950s, a young senator named John F. Kennedy, who'd written a book about senatorial courage, um, was uh, made head of a committee to choose the greatest senators of all time, whose portraits would be, would be there, you know, permanently. And people like Clay and Calhoun. Well, weren't Clay, Webster. Webster, and Calhoun already there? And Kennedy said we, you know, th there was an the idea they should add a couple more. I thought that they were they that they were part of this process. In any event, um, Vandenberg was someone uh, who I mean, a consensus formed that Vandenberg, and and that's pretty impressive, that you know Vandenberg belonged there. And um, and I think that. There was enormous respect from people who probably at the same time looked in the mirror and asked, what is wrong with Arthur? I mean, that, you know, that he's not willing to let ambition rule his, his life uh, in the way that, you know, most would-be presidents. I mean, he's, he's a... He, he's, loved, he loved the Senate. He, he loved that forum. But, but it was interesting because they, 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 so they added two portraits and one was Vandenberg and the other was Robert Wagner because yeah. they needed a Republican and a Democrat. Oh, La Follette was in there too. Yeah, yeah. And, but they needed a Republican and a Democrat and it was really hard at the time to have a great Democratic senator who wasn't a Southern segregationist. All the committee chairs, the big senators were all... Which is, by the way, the controversy muted 
but very real about renaming the Russell Senate office building. Isn't it, I think it's a very astute move on Schumer's part. It was very shrewd. And it was, and don't think it was intended to uh, uh, divide the opposition. Um, divide the opposition, but also you're willing to give up your own senator because you really don't want to go into yeah, Russell's but, heritage. Yeah, exactly. You, you, disowning Richard Russell at this stage in history is, uh, is a politically advantageous thing to do. <laughs> yes. Um, as war broke out in Europe, um, Vanderberg started as a very staunch isolationist, um, and then uh, as the war ended, he was instrumental in um, the formation of the United Nations, both um, abroad and at home. Um, and I was wondering, like, where did this transition from isolationist to internationalist really happen for Vanderberg? His easy, quick answer was, well, Pearl Harbor changed it for everybody. And there's a kernel of truth there that said, we're no longer safe behind our oceans, we can be attacked. But it really was a more gradual thing where, I mean, part of it, part of his isolationism was also great hostility and distrust of Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, there was a great deal of personal animosity there. When the king and queen of England came to visit in 1938, is it 38 or 39? 39. 39. And they're there before the outbreak of war, but with war clouds gathering to build goodwill for, for our friendship, solidify our friendship with the British. And there's a receiving line in the White at a, at a, there's a they call it a musicale, there's a White House event, and the and Vandenberg is in going through the reception line, and there's the king standing there with Franklin Roosevelt, and Roosevelt says to turns to the king and said, here's the man who thinks he's going to succeed me, but he isn't, without mentioning Vandenberg's name. Mm. And then the next day, there's a, there's a reception at the British Embassy, and Vandenberg is introduced to the king, and the king says, oh, it's very nice to put a face with a name. And so there, there was great personal bitterness there. But then you've got Pearl Harbor, and then you've got the Mackinac Charter, so you're getting the Republicans and Vandenberg, Vandenberg kind of finds himself celebrated for making this statement when he's really just trying to save the party, but he's looked like suddenly he appears more to be more forward-looking than even he maybe thought of himself as. And then Roosevelt, I mean, as, as we talk about the end of World War I, and Wilson had famously, when they're trying to put together the League of Nations, had named a delegation which he headed and which had no prominent Republicans. And so when, when Roosevelt comes back and tries to sell the League of Nations covenant, the charter, to, to the Senate, to the Republicans in the Senate, they say, well, you didn't, and, and says you can't change a word of it. They're saying, well, you know, we weren't in on this. And, you know, you're dictating it to us, and you didn't even consult us. And so Roosevelt understood that after coming back, for, he had to come back from Yalta where they were making some plans to hold a conference in San Francisco to organize the United Nations in, in the spring of 1945, that he couldn't not have Republican representation on the, the U.S. delegation to create the U.N. And one of the Republicans had to be Arthur Vandenberg because at that time he was the, the Republican foreign, foreign policy spokesman in the Senate. And so he names Vandenberg, along with his House Carter counterpart, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Charles Eaton, and Texas Republican, Texas Democrat Tom Connolly, who chaired the Foreign Relations Committee when, when Vandenberg wasn't, and the uh, Saul Bloom, the Democrat chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and Harold Stassen, and the chairman of Barnard College, this is more than you want to know, but the president of Barnard College, Virginia Gildersleeve, that's the American delegation. They're going to go and with their advisors and represent the United States to create the United Nations. And then Roosevelt dies. And the Secretary of State at that point, acting and soon to be permanent, is, is Edward Statinius, who's a young United States Steel executive and attorney who's pretty limited. He manages he's the State Department. He's deeply mediocre. Yes, he manages the State <laughs> Department, but he's no foreign policy expert. That's well said. And, and Harry Truman comes into office, and of course, he was famously unfamiliar with foreign policy. Roosevelt had had lunch with him once, hadn't bothered to tell him about things like an atomic bomb and come in the works. And the, 
and Vandenberg becomes really the dumb. And, and Vandenberg goes there with, with John Foster Dulles as his advisor and the assistant secretary of state, a fellow named Nelson Rockefeller, assistant secretary of state for Latin American affairs, who was also happens to be a Republican in the Democratic And who had many Latin American affairs. Well, yes, he did. <laughs> and he also had relations with the Latin, well, multiple relations, but, but, the, but after the war, if you think, if, if you go back and you look at the people who went, the countries represented at the United Nations Conference, the, the Latin Americans were actually the single biggest block because you had countries that had been the enemies the, in, or af associated with the Axis powers. They were not invited. You had colonies who had not yet achieved their independence. They weren't represented. So Rockefeller sort of has in his pocket a lot of the, a commanding block of votes in creation, in getting, in, in approving the charter and getting the things. So, so the, there's Vandenberg, Dulles, and Rockefeller are kind of the, the, the power base among the American delegates at the, at the UN. And so, so he finds himself, long would answer your question, representing the United States and a broader international interest of the United States in creating the League of Nations. So it's a, and, and so he, and he emerges from that as kind of the spokesman for the United States in, in, the, in world affairs there. And um, so that, that was kind of the, the process that brings him along. And then when, and then along comes the Marshall Plan when, um, that, that needs Republican approval, and that means George Marshall working with Arthur Vandenberg. And then comes the need for a defensive alliance in Europe, which becomes NATO. And Vandenberg happened to have been with Marshall at, the, at a conference of Latin Americans in, in Rio in 1947, um, when they, they finally got approval of, of the, a Latin American defense of the Organization of American States, Latin American Defensive Alliance, and, and, and Vandenberg wanted to make sure, and the Latins wanted to make sure at, at, at the UN that they, that the UN Charter allowed regional power blocks like that, regional security arrangements, um, which John Foster Dulles was, was skeptical of. Um, and, and so it turns out that that became a pattern that could be used to have NATO created under the, without violating the, the Charter of the United Nations. And it was Rockefeller's idea. Um, and he uh, persuaded Senator Vandenberg uh, to join him in mm -hmm. promoting this um, against the State Department, against the administration. <coughs> the original idea of the United Nations, of course, was that this was a quasi-world government. And the Security Council would be, as its name suggests, responsible for repelling military uh, threats and the like. This is where the talk of a world army uh, and the threat to American sovereignty uh, all entered the conversation. Um, but they were, they were not supposed to. The, the British, for example, Anthony Eden said, either we are a world organization or we're not. Rockefeller, with the help of the Latin delegation, um, convinced enough key figures in the American delegation, above all Senator Vandenberg, um, that in the name of self-defense, in other words, um, you weren't undermining the basic organizing principle of the United Nations until such time as the United Nations could come to the aid of someone, for example, who had been attacked, then it was an ancient principle, the right of self-defense. And that's how they packaged this. And they amended the UN Charter specifically to permit regional defensive alliances. And that, in turn, paved the way for NATO. Well, and they had to do that because there was big debate over the veto, but the, the members of the Security Council, which of course included Russia, could veto any action. And that, the, the Latins along with us were concerned, you know, if, if one of us is attacked, um, let's say by 
communist insurgents, then uh, we can't do anything because the Soviets will veto any attempt to come to the aid of, of another country. Well, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, don't you wish all political conversations were like this? Let's give them a hand. <laughs>